no analysis. The next thing is to grasp the thing, grip it, close it in your hand. Might be better if it was a coin. Here's an actual coin of Marcus Aurelius. Uh, so if I touch it, it could be a coin, it could be a wall. I feel it, oh, I, I think it's a coin. I got it in my grip. Oh, I can really feel it now. I get the weight of it. I can feel the texture. That's a coin. I might even be able to identify that's a that's a ancient Roman coin of Marcus Aurelius. The highest level, so that's analyzing it, that's logical thought. Highest level is you take your other hand and you grip it tight. Now you've got, you're bringing the rest of your knowledge to bear on the knowledge you just gotten here. So I know it's a coin. Um, I know it's a Marcus Aurelius coin. Well, what is a coin? Now we go into the abstract thought uh, and integrate it with, with uh, all my other knowledge that I might have. So a coin is a, uh, it's a piece of metal, a certain shape but it has a depiction, it has a stamp stamped to show, uh, you know, a ruler uh, that's saying that this is this coin is worth a certain amount of money or trade. Um, and back in ancient times, bronze, which it's made out of, had its own intrinsic value. Um, if it was a, a modern quarter, uh, if it was 50 years ago, that quarter would be made out of silver. Silver had an intrinsic value all by itself. I can melt that quarter down and it still would have maybe close to a quarter's worth of value give or take. Modern quarters, they have no value intrinsic. It's just what the government says it's worth. And, and you know, and I can go on and on about understanding really what this object is, integrating my knowledge, starting from guessing to believing to analyzing and having some real knowledge about it to integrating my knowledge the, the, the form, the level of the forms and um, integrating with, with other information. Okay, so that's chapters five, six, and seven. Again, four is the, the key point here. Now we get to constitutions um, in, in chapter eight. So uh, under constitutions, you see I put four, 445. Uh, that's where we left off talking about the psyche before chapter five and then chapter eight, 544 to chapter nine, 580. Socrates uh, gives us another way of understanding all of this. Um, uh, at the end of book four, we have established what is philo what is uh, justice? What is it in the individual? What does it mean to be um, uh, a just person, a philosopher king? And he's already established like the, the most just person is going to be king or queen of himself or herself. Um, and, uh, you know, that's a form of government. There are other forms of government. And he starts to have this conversation in, in, at the end of book four, but he's waylaid and off to the other conversation. Now he's back to it. So we didn't finish that discussion. So there's one type of government that is healthy. Um, which is a, uh, a, a monarchy um, led by a philosopher. And there are a myriad kinds of unhealthy um, forms of government in the world. And so there would be in our own psyche potentially, he says, but you know, there's at least five kinds, the traditional kinds that were known at that time. Um, these five kinds of governments are constitutions in the world and thus five type types potentially in a psyche. Um, and so he's going to talk about the unhealthy ones so that we better understand what it is to be an unhealthy psyche, a healthy psyche. What I say is really, he said, he talks about there's six, um, but there's three main types and three subtypes. So, we have rule by reason, which is one main type. And in that is monarchy, which is a king or queen or aristocracy. He says, <clears throat> you can imagine, and really he does imagine, uh, philosopher kings and queens um, kind of rotating and people retire, new ones come in. There might be joint rulership. As long as they're philosophers, um, it's a monarchy. There's one or it's an aristocracy, a group of of the best 
philosophers to rule using reason. And that's also inside of ourselves, being a king or queen of yourself using reason. Number two is ruled by spirit. So a democracy, uh, back in ancient times, they had a democracy that was called Sparta. It was the whole country, government, society, uh, was um, centered around their uh, soldiers. So uh, democracy uh, is ruled by, um, by war. And um, in a person, it's ruled by that part of us that goes to war on our own behalf if we need to. It's our passions. It's our emotion. Um, it's ruled by the spirit. Then there's ruled by appetites, and there's three types here. So uh, there's the necessary appetites. We all have necessary appetites. We have to eat, we have to drink. Um, we need shelter unless we live in a really nice place, um, and uh, etc. <clears throat> we need to reproduce if we want to have a society. Um, those are necessary appetites. Uh, in society, the people who uh, are focused on feeding the appetites, um, how, how do you get your needs met? How do you get uh, food and shelter and water? You do it with money. So, so money is the, the, um, a way of understanding our appetites because, again, that's how you buy things, right? So people who focus on becoming rich um, are the oligarchs. And inside ourselves, it's when those those uh, necessary appetites are in charge. So um, it's not as good as being ruled by reason, um, but there are worse things, such as being ruled by the necessary and unnecessary appetites. So in a society, that's called democracy. Everyone's in charge. In the United States, we're a form of democracy, but we're a, a, a representative republic. Um, in Athens, they had pure democracy. Pure democracy means one person, one vote. Uh, and they would actually rotate who got to go and vote today. And they would vote on everything, whatever, whatever happened that day. So they could vote on going to war today. And whoever was there, um, you know, they, I think they had 500 people at a time. Today's your day to vote. Uh, they might decide whether or not to go to war. The next day, it might be proposed, let's re, let's re vote on that. And there's a 500 different people and they're gonna maybe change their mind. Um, so that's a pure democracy. And that's what he's talking about here. In a human, in a person, uh, you know, I have an appetite for food, water. I've also developed an appetite for cigars. Um, I have an appetite for philosophy. If I live a de de democratic um, internal rule, it means each one of those gets an equal say in what I do any given day. Um, and so that's not a healthy way to live because there's no consistency in it. One day I might be doing philosophy. Another, another day I might be doing heroin. <laughs> so, um, so potentially honor and wisdom too. My, uh, and I, I say all societies here. So, um, so the necessary and unnecessary appetites, it covers everything, good and bad. You know, so from pursuing wisdom and philosophy down to uh, maybe pursuing um, cocaine and you know whatever. Uh, Alcibiades was a famous figure in Plato's Republic. He was a real historic figure, just like Socrates. He was a wealthy uh, man, young man. Uh, when we find him early in, in some of the writings, he was good looking, he was rich, he was smart. He followed Socrates around sometimes and, and debated and learned. And I think Socrates, Plato, uh, thought he might be a, you know, uh, a fine student and example someday, but he was a Democrat inside of himself. So um, he pursued everything. He was a womanizer, <laughs> he liked to get drunk. Um, uh, 
Uh, he fought on behalf of Athens as a general, but when things didn't go the way he liked it, he switched sides and went to Sparta and fought against Athens. Another time he switches sides, he goes to Persia and fights against Athens or even against Sparta. Uh, he gets in trouble because he's um, getting busy with uh, the wives of different leaders. And, and he ends up you know, not living a very healthy philosophical life. Um, I think he's supposed to have gotten murdered by, I think, a Spartan general or, um, or king <laughs> for messing around with his wife. And then finally, we have the lowest, most unhealthy constitution. When a society is ruled by uh, a, a tyrant, it's like one leader, but it's not a king who is duly appointed or born into it and is really a philosopher king. Um, but somebody, a tyrant was somebody who took power um, by force and uh, in this example, a tyrant is ruled by unnecessary, lawless appetites. So really think of a tyrant as somebody like Saddam Hussein said earlier. Um, uh, you know, many leaders become possessed or um, they have a, a, an appetite for power and money they become corrupt right power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely so the example is a tyrant like saddam hussein who is in complete control of his government but what's on the throne is um the love of power itself and uh, nothing else matters. There's no right and wrong except for, for more power and control. Uh, in Saddam Hussein's case, right, he supposedly didn't sleep in the same uh, mansion two, day, two nights in a row because people were out to kill him. Uh, nobody to his face because he would have them killed and all their family. Um, but he couldn't trust anybody. He didn't trust anybody, even if he could. Uh, had people eat test his food so he wasn't poisoned, et cetera, et cetera. And eventually he died um, pretty awfully, you know, like Nebuchadnezzar out, out in the fields. But um, he lived a pretty miserable life. Um, an internal tyrant, if you have a psyche that is, has a, a tyrannical constitution, that means you take some unnecessary appetite. And that's what's in charge of you. So think of, it could be a corrupt politician. You could also uh, think of a, a um, homeless drug addict, homeless probably because of their drug addiction. Everything that they do centers around that tyrant of their addiction, their love for the pleasure or their pursuit to try to get that pleasure back of the substance, the cocaine, the uh, methamphetamine, what have you. Okay, so this is another way to understand our psyche and what a just psyche or unjust psyche. Um, now, democracy to oligarchy, I'm gonna skip through this. Uh, I use this as an example. He talks about how in real governments, they devolve from good ones to bad. And inside a person, generationally, um, you know, it's like, well, if there are ever good governments, why aren't they here now? Well, he says, because these things can devolve and he gives examples of how um, it can devolve. And it's kind of a neat little thing, but I'm going long already and it's not necessary to my point. So I'm gonna skip through that. Um, so a just constitution is a monarchy. You're king or queen of yourself. So we get there at, at book nine now, we've gone through, there's been a lot of things at book nine, towards the end of book nine, 580C, Shall we hire a herald then, or shall I myself make the proclamation that the son of Ariston, Glaucon, has just said from his questioning, uh, the best man and the most just is the happiest, and that he who is most kingly and a king over himself, excuse me, and the most evil and the most unjust is the most unhappy. He who is the most tyrant over himself and over the state. So, uh, 
and it doesn't matter whether people know it or not. Again, this is just another way that he's reinforcing and explaining, trying to understand what a just psyche is. Um, but in this case, that fourth part, that super ego, um, is the, the constitution. So we have our three parts, re reason, spirit, uh, and appetites. Um, but we also have a government. One of those governs us, or they take turns governing us. That's our constitution. That's our auto, our self. Uh, well, I better go back here. Politea, I'll get to that. Um, and so he just reiterated that. We agree, yes. Uh, obviously, um, uh, if you're not just on the inside, you're not going to have a happy life. Mic drop, another mic drop, because, you know, this is the third mic drop, right? We've really gone through this stuff pretty exhaustively. Um, uh, it's amazing when you re really start to understand the Republic. It's really hard in the original, um, at first at least. There's so much stuff, and there is so much stuff that I'm skipping over. Um, but yet, look how much is just reiterating or giving different examples, different parables, different ways of understanding its main point that began back there in the beginning with Kefels. Another way to understand it is a different, he says another way to understand um, the psyche and people are there's different loves. There's love for gain, love for honor, and love for wisdom. Um, one of those is going to be in charge. So forget for a moment the constitutions. Let's just say, what do you love? Which part of your mind? Um, they each have a love. We all have all the loves. We all have, we all like to gain, have money, and have things, and have resources, and have pleasure. We all love honor. We like to win. We like to be recognized. We like to have relationships where we're valued. Uh, we all love wisdom. There's a, we all have an urge to learn and understand things, but which one is the RK in your life is what he's saying here. Um, again, back to the throne. One of those is going to sit on the throne and that's the kind of person that you, you are. And the healthiest is a philosopher who's been, who has all of these, but has them in balance. So the ruling principle RK of men's soul is in some cases, this faculty and in some, one of the other two, as it may happen. And that's why the primary classes of men are also three. Philosopher, lover, wisdom. Lover of victory, philo, nikon. Um, think of a sports star, uh, an athlete of any kind, or a politician um, that wants to win an election. Uh, uh, a Hollywood movie star. Um, they may love the acting, but they may just love the attention that they get and the acclaim that they get. And we all have, we all like all of that to varying degrees. Uh, and the lover of gain, again, somebody who, who wants to be rich, who uh, uh, think of the, the robber barons, <laughs> right? Um, greed, who could say gain, um, uh, can sometimes become, the, well, probably is the overarching uh, love that they have and it can become more and more so. Um, some people, the more money they get, the more they worry about money. Um, all right. Now, another analogy towards, still in book nine, the image, one of my favorites. Um, Socrates says, uh, okay, another way to think about this is I want you to imagine a creature. Three, three, there's three creatures. There's a many headed beast like a, uh, a scylla or a snake-like, like a hydra that has many heads. In this case, on this coin, you'll see there's a, like a snake-like thing to the bottom left corner, has two dog heads and a woman. Um, that's the scylla, scylla. But uh, there's a lot of different mythological monsters that have many heads. And he likens that they, um, that is representative of our appetites. There are many potential appetites. It's like a, a reptile and just seeks pleasure, avoids pain. Um, and then there's the lion that represents the emotion, the spirit, uh, 
uh, lion heart. Um, and then you've got the human, in this case, is wrestling with the lion. This is the inner man. Um, and wrap it all up in your imagination, all those three things that are on that coin, and put them inside the package. And the, the package is a person. And he's saying that, well, I'll just read it. Then mold about them outside, the likeness of one, that of man, so that to anyone who's unable to look within, entos horan, but who can only see the external sheath, it appears to be one living creature, the man. But so what Socrates is saying here is like most people, that's all they see. Like people are people. Um, but to understand the psyche, to understand people, at a deeper level is to realize that we all have these different parts inside of us and they can be wrestling with each other. And they often are. That's an unhealthy psyche is when those parts are not working together, they're working against each other. Here's an image from the Phaedrus. Now the Phaedrus is another book uh, by Plato. Um, but here's an example, another image of the psyche, but this is like what it looks like when it's more healthy instead of wrestling with itself. And so in the Phaedrus, he says, well, liken the soul to a composite nature of a pair of, of matched horses, winged matched horses and a charioteer. So at first he's talking about what, what, how do souls begin and what are gods, you know, the gods souls like, um, they're not in bodies. They're, you know, uh, ethereal or whatever, but imagine, two winged chariots with matched horses, meaning like uh, if you have a, a really good chariot, you've got two equally matched, really good horses and a chariot driver. Well, in this story, um, some of the gods or people, these, these souls flying, lose their wings for various reasons and they crash to earth and they become embodied in human form and that's us. So we have two horses, but they're not matched and both noble. Um, and there's a charioteer, right? So the first, the charioteer of the human soul drives a pair, right? Driving. Secondly, one of the horses is noble. The one to the left, if you're looking at the coin, it's on the right side on the chariot. Uh, and of noble breed. See, that's a good looking horse. It's going forward. It's pulling the chariot forward. The chariot driver is your reason. The noble horse is your thumos, your passion, um, your spirit. And then there's this crazy horse, uh, quite opposite in breed, you know, and it's actually black. The other horse is white. Um, this horse is wild. It's looking at us on the coin, it's scraggly. That's our appetites. And so, uh, this image is like a healthy, about as healthy as we can get the reality of a psyche with those three parts, intellect, passion, appetites. The appetites, you know, when your alarm goes off early in the morning uh, and you, you need to get up, but you don't want to, your appetites say, go back to sleep. I'm tired. Or when you're eating dessert and you ate one slice of pie, but it tastes so good, your appetites want to eat more. It's up to reason and your spirit, your passion, what's really important to you to guide you to make balanced, healthy decisions. Go to work rather than sleeping in. Um, eat, a, eat a little bit of dessert maybe, but not a whole pie. That's the best we can hope for. We are imperfect beings. We don't have wings. We're on this earth, but we can put it all together and go forward rather than being wrestling with ourselves. Uh, and um, I guess in this image, if there's a fourth part shown, it would be the reins. Like uh, who's holding the reins um, is like your government. What, what type of government do you have? The, the reasons holding the reins. But if, uh, if that wild beast had control of the chariot, you know, all kinds of havoc would be wreaked. Uh, the pilot of the soul, if healthy, is reason. Okay, now, autopolitea, so self-constitution. 
is the final analysis at the end of book nine. And it's plain that this is the purpose of the law, nomos, which is the ally of all classes in the state. And this is the aim of our control of children, are not letting them be free before we have established, so to speak, a constitutional government within them, an autopolitea. So what he's saying is because we have a wild horse, <laughs> because we're not perfectly healthy all the time, um, we need laws, external government for those people, at least those people in society that aren't philosophers, that aren't constantly checking themselves and keeping themselves in balance. Uh, we have criminals, we have addicts, we have uh, all kinds of things that we need the laws in, in our society to have consequences, to have rules, so we all can get along. Ideally, we'd all manage ourselves really well. We wouldn't need external laws. But that's the ideal. This is also why we don't just have children and let them go. Or even when they're old enough to basically fend for themselves, we don't let them go fend for themselves because we're trying to get them not just to a certain physical development, but psychological development of establishing in them the rules. You know, as parents, we have rules for them because we love them. It's for their good, hopefully. Um, and we try to instill that, and then we send them off into the world and hope that they have will take that and internalize that government, a healthy, balanced government, by fostering the best element in them with the aid of the like in ourselves. So foster in their intellect, with our intellect, and set up a similar guardian and ruler in the child. Guardian and ruler. I think what he's talking about here is the guardian is, I know earlier on he talks about the guardian being like the ruler, but he also talks about the, the soldiers being the guardians because they're the ones that actually stand guard and will go off the fight. So at this point, I think the ruler um, is the intellect. The guardian is your passion, your emotions, that which gets angry at injustice and is protective. And only then we set it free, the child, go off into the world, reproduce and multiply. Autopolitea. Okay, it's going to get a little redundant if it's not already redundant. But basically saying that this is what the healthy person will do. Keep his eye fixed on the constitution in his soul and make all choices, public and private, will be based on, like, is this good for me or not good for me? Remember being a friend to yourself? Like, would you recommend this to your own child um, if they were you? 